everyone out there. Kia ora tato. Welcome along to another exciting edition of Showy Ovaries, a podcast where I, pre-menopausal Penny Ashton, learn all I can about the change before it smacks me in the face, amongst other places. A quick reminder, I am not a doctor. So please seek out your GP or specialist for further information on medical situations. But I can write you a poem, which I think is an excellent segue to introduce my next guest. One of my favorite poets and people in general, the only other performance poet with epilepsy from Christchurch that I am aware of, someone whose smile can light up a whole room and whose dirty laugh can make you wonder what she's been up to. So please welcome Tusiata Avia, all the way in Ototahi Christ. Talofa lady, how are you doing? Yay, Talofa, I'm doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good? Excellent. So how is level two? Yeah, I don't want to make anyone in level three land feel bad, so I'm going to pretend it's worse than it is. (laughs) I look at you and hope that that's our future, well, maybe we have to go through some stuff before we get to that future, but be free, enjoy yourself. There's no reason that all of us should suffer, so I don't think we, well, some people might begrudge you. But I am not these people. So I'm glad that you're enjoying some freedoms. Yeah, I'm, there. I'm very grateful. I'm grateful that yeah. we have the freedoms that we have down here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a nice big introduction for you with all of your fabulous accolades. So brace yourself. Okay. Here we go. Tusiata Avia is a Christchurch born, award winning poet, playwright, and all round performance powerhouse. She is of Samoan descent, and that comes shining through in all of her work. Her first book of poetry, which started as a solo show, was called Wild Dogs Under My Skirt, which she performed all over the world and has since turned into a multiplayer show that has been smashing audiences here and in New York, and I imagine would have been touring right now if it wasn't for this bloody pandemic. She has published four poetry books now, I believe. That's correct. Four? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And has been shortlisted for the New Zealand Ockham Book Awards, and this year her book, The Savage Colonizer, won the Mary and Peter Biggs Award for Poetry. She has held the Fulbright Pacific Writers Fellowship at the University of Hawaii and has won the Janet Frame Literary Award Trust Award. Whoops, no, Literary Trust Award. (laughs) So many awards, it's hard to get my tongue around. In 2020, she was appointed a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for Services to Poetry and the Arts. And personally, she's been one of my most favorite and excellent judges in an event that I used to run in the Auckland Writers Festival called Poetry Idol. That was in 2008, Mm -hmm. my God, in 2016. And she was also a judge for the slam I run at WOMAD in 2018. So many accolades. Again, I welcome Tusiata Avia along. So do you you like hearing all that? And now we're out of time. It's been nice (laughs) knowing you. (laughs) See you later. You're just so fabulous. I have to fit it all in there. (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to jump in straight away with some mm-hmm. questions for you. So the first one, I'm sort of, I've decided I'm going to might start this with everybody because it's just so fascinating what people's responses are. But what has your relationship with your body been like in your life, and and has that that been on quite a journey over this time? So is this a twelve hour long? <laughs> yeah, that, I know. That is such a big question. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean. In the smallest nutshell, I can get a big body into. I mean, I've lived my whole life, my whole puberty onwards life in a big body, you right. know, and it's difficult to live in a big body in New Zealand. Because how tall are you? Well, I'm five foot ten, but it's not so much the height as it is the width, you know. Right, yeah. And, yeah, living in a big body in New Zealand is not an easy thing to do. Mm by any means so yeah just loads of shame and um all the awful things about being in a big body being in a fat body you know and I'm really glad to see people reclaiming that word yeah but I think one of the best things that happened for me was spending time in the Middle East right in particular and this is often not expected by people because of the way that we look at the Middle East however Being in the Middle East was great for me because there is a different body standard for women there. So I lived in Egypt for a year and the size and shape of my body pretty much lined up with what a size 10 here is. Right, okay. Yeah. And you felt felt great? I felt great. And it was the first time I'd felt great. And when was that? 92. 
seven. Right, okay. And it was the first time you'd felt great ever. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, man. Yeah. The first time I felt beautiful and as if I was in a beautiful body. Right, okay. that, That was admired. The same in Africa. I spent some time in Africa, but mostly I was moving about in Africa. And then when, you know, like all New Zealanders who were wandering, I got to London, it pretty much stayed the same. And I think because it's just so multicultural yeah, there. absolutely. I had a Nigerian boyfriend. He thought my my bum was to die for, <laughs> you know, Obviously. and the rest of me. So that was really important to me. And I knew when and as far as the journey with my fat body but when I knew that I was returning back here in 2001 I knew it was going to be hard Mm, right because I was returning back to this ridiculously narrow um ideal yeah yeah it's like going from living in this wonderfully diverse relationship with yourself to then trying to fit yourself into a letterbox yeah right and do you think that's from what you see or is that generally what you get from men and other people? This is generally what I get from men, from mm-hmm. women, from everybody. Right. And I'm really sorry to say that about New Zealand, but it is the truth. This has been my truth and yeah. every other big woman's truth that I've ever come across. Right. There's, there's no room here. No room. And have you managed to to put that aside or is that just all come back down on you being back in New Zealand? Well, unfortunately, it's it's something that's revisited me again because just lately, about three years ago, I lost a lot of weight after being really sick. And for the first time in my life, I was in a normal size body, a normal with quotation marks around it. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden I became beautiful and I became acceptable. And everybody probably commented. Constantly. Yeah. Just constantly. And because I lost weight so fast, like it all fell off me, 45 kilos in a year. Man. But of course I spent that year in bed because I was sick and I lost that weight because I was sick. And so it was a sudden shock to everyone to see me in this much smaller, quotation marks, normal body. And then over the past two years, I've put that weight on again and come back to my to my normal size, which is about a 22 in clothing size. And that's been a, am am I allowed to swear? Oh, fuck yes. It's been a total head fuck. Yeah, right. Total head fuck. And I think it's almost taken me back to the relationship that I had with my body when I was a teenager. It's been very mind fucking. Yeah, I'm sure, Um, especially because, you know, being in bed for a year, being ill is such a trauma and then everybody congratulating on you for the effect of that is is such a head fuck. I can see that. And I feel like the gains that I've made over four decades of being in a big body and working at accepting being in a big body in a big body hating country, I feel as if they've all kind of slipped between my fingers and I feel in many ways that I'm back to where I was as a teenager right very strange experience so something that I'm having to work on quite hard yeah of course when I lost all that weight the doctor sent me off for eating disorder counseling and that was really interesting because what I discovered is yes I always have had some form of eating disorder Right. I've also realised that so have a massive percentage of women in this country. Yeah, yeah. So I've done a lot of reading and thinking and am seeing an amazing counsellor, eating disorder counsellor in the States via Zoom. Great. Amazing and expensive, but amazing all, all the same. So, yeah, it's... um. It is a long question. It's a long question, and I'll probably stop there, otherwise I'll take up the rest of the... Yeah, and that's so true because, you know, I can tell you till I'm blue in the face that you... I mean, you're fucking magnificent when you're on stage and off. You just have this energy and this power, and I think that's amazing, but you don't give a fuck what I say because it's how you feel. I do feel like that on stage. Right. I've got to say. Right, okay. It all falls away from me on stage, and I do feel magnificent on stage. Well, you are so correct. However, (laughs) it's the rest of my life. 
life yeah, when right. I'm not on stage. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to these things, not to the same extent with the extremities, but like for me it was because my epilepsy medication made me hungry, but I didn't know for 16 years. And, mm. you know, when you're railing against trying to lose weight constantly, doing everything you're supposed to and you still can't lose weight and then get judged for that. So, yeah, and it just gets in. It just gets in and that's the thing I find really hard and for me Matt was good around that but it's interesting you've talked about the Middle East and you've talked about Egypt and stuff and, and what about Samoa? It's, it's a this this is something that is surprising too like you would imagine that it would be a lot more accepting over there but not necessarily my first trip to Samoa I was 14 and constantly got you're too big you're too big you're too big and to a 14 year old it's such a damaging um, time this was from my family right yeah. my massive my massive Samoan family and yeah it was and a lot of the women that were saying this to me were really big themselves don't ask me why I can I've thought about it over the years I can only put it down to some weird kind of western ideal I don't know I really don't know Right. But it's it, my experience in Samoa has not been one that's made me feel happy in my body. Right. That's a, oh, that's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, so speaking of bodies, so we'll get to the, the meat and potatoes of the podcast, mm-hmm. as it were. So, to start, did you know anything about menopause before it started to happen to you? Yeah, I did. I heard a little from my mother, kind of after the fact. After the fact, but not during. Uh, well, after. The fact of her own menopause, she didn't talk about it during the time, but she did talk about it a little afterwards. I've got to say it wasn't particularly positive. Right. But I went off and did a workshop, kind of a little bit of an airy-fairy, slightly witchy workshop. <laughs> but And I'd done kind of a, I don't know, what does she call it, menstruality? Menstruality. Menstruality workshop. Right by the same person earlier on before menopause really hit and it it framed it all in a a really positive light great and I was just I looked for the notes last night and I pulled them out and all I really found was a whole lot lot of like doodles and random thoughts and one of the things that I came away with was feeling really positive about it and or, and almost looking forward to it right? and not wanting to go off and research because I knew what the information out there was like and I did not want to be bombarded by a whole lot of menopause shaming. Right. You know, I've had enough body shaming in my life. Absolutely. So I did not want to be bombarded by menopause shaming as well. And did you think that um, looking into the science behind it would make you feel like that? Well, the problem is the science isn't just the science. The science is always biased in one way or another. Okay. It's always looked at through some kind of a lens and very rarely is it through a positive lens. Right. And so these workshops that I did were were really positive and made me feel good about the insides of my body. Great. And so it made me really determine I am not going to go off and make myself feel shit. So whether this is a good idea or not, I don't know if it is for anybody else. For me, I just kind of like went with the tide. Right, or the the receding of the tide. (laughs) Yeah, I just kind of went with the tide and I didn't do a whole lot of research about menopause before that, apart from the thinking around more of the emotional and, dare I say it, spiritual stuff around it. You can say spiritual. I'm not spiritual, but you can certainly say spiritual. I can spiritual. say spiritual here. Is it okay to say, to say spiritual? I'll allow it. I'll allow all right, it. All right. <laughs> so that was, that was more of what I knew about menopause beforehand. So And that has served me really well. Great. Great. And so how did it manifest in you? I'll just go back a bit, though, because yep. when I was looking at my notes, my workshop notes, yes. apart from all the squiggles and dreams that I'd written in there, like actual dreams, right? I found a note to myself about the marketplace and no longer being viable in the marketplace. So the marketplace being the relationship marketplace. Right, okay. And the beauty marketplace, particularly the white standard of beauty marketplace that exists here in New Zealand. 
and having to leave that marketplace now, not just to find a partner, which I still don't have, but to be able to find myself in a different way. So when you leave the marketplace of the nightclub floor, which it was usually, that was the marketplace for me in the past. So right. where is the place now? Yeah. And I I guess that was one of the big questions that menopause posed for me is I'm leaving the marketplace. So where is the place now? Not just to find a partner, of course, but where I see myself, where I experience myself as being attractive. So we, where will you be desired? Is that sort of what desirable, you Desirable, particularly. Yeah. And so what is it that I want now? And have you figured that out? No. <laughs> I haven't. But what I have figured out is that marketplace is not, never was, but it's super not a good place for me. Right. Yeah. Right. So then you've stepped out of that, so that's a positive thing. It is a positive thing, but even just to think those thoughts now and to ask myself, well, what is it that I want now? Right, okay. You know, which it's, is a big, massive question. I've had a couple of people say that they love being invisible, quote, to those traditional standards. No, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't think I would. No. I do not no, love, right. yeah. no. Fair. I don't love being invisible. And do you feel that you are? Yes, in that marketplace, I really fucking do. Right. It's interesting when I have been out lately to bars or whatever with my younger friends, like I'm just completely overlooked. Right. Like looked past. Yeah. But then I think I got a lot of that here in New Zealand anyway because of being in a big body. Yeah, I certainly did in my teen years, completely, completely ignored in my teen years. And. And I think that, I think I've got a double whammy now, you know. Right. So you just need to be on stage, on stage the whole time. Because I think that you have that in you all the time, but you don't feel that. But it's a shame you just can't take a little mini stage with you into a nightclub and stand there. I know, right. I mean, I pretty much never go to a nightclub. I mean, I don't think I want to go to a nightclub now. No. But we all have to go to bars, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I do like that. I just, I, when yeah. I go to a nightclub, I'm like, can you turn it down? And where are the fucking seats? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah where do I want to be now yeah you know what do I, what do I want now yeah and it's not to be invo- invisible it's really not to be invisible no yeah no invisible for me thanks I very can much. relate to that indeed yeah so well hopefully you'll find that place yeah I mean it's a finding it's a process right? isn't it yeah it's a finding yeah yeah absolutely so then, so how did menopause manifest in your um, fabulous self? Well, I I think it came slowly, but kind of crept up on me. Right. But also had a, sorry to use the S word again, but th- there's a, there was a spiritual dimension around it for me. I don't want you to apologize. <laughs> I've tainted you with myself. This is about you. It's not about me. So. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll I'll be liberal with the S word then. I don't know what you were going to say. Then I was like, shit. What? What is that? No, spiritual- <laughs> oh, okay. Spirituality. Yes. Because <laughs> it's, it's whatever works for you, right? It's yeah. The best of thing. So the yeah. year before my my father died, I went to see him in Samoa, and we were in our village, and I was swimming in the sea. And I passed the most enormous blood clot, like the size of your hand. Oh, my God. Size of your hand. I don't know, a couple of inches thick. Wow. Yeah. And it's like Um, a a child. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like quite a gross image for everybody listening. But No, this is – I want the honesty. This is good. Yes, the honesty. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And – that was, I mean, I mean, you named a book after that, did you? Yes, I did. There and you go. I'd already, well, I had already written a book called Blood Clot, right? Which is about it's about the Samoan goddess of war, Nafanoa, who was born as a blood clot, wow, and then buried in the earth and then grew up out of the the ground. After I had my daughter Sabella, I had the same kind of blood clot in the bath, right? So. For me, that kind of marks the beginning of my menopause because I wasn't having any kind of... I also think that perimenopause, yeah, I don't know, perimenopause, menopause, it's all pretty fluid to me, you know. Right. Mm. Well, perimenopause is sort of, you know, what we consider to be menopause in a way and menopause is when it actually just ends. 
Yeah. 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 I don't know. My experience of it is, is that it's been pretty fluid. But that blood clot that marked the beginning of it for me, and that was the year before my father died. And then the year that he died, straight after he died, actually, I think menopause proper kicked in. And so did the, uh, so did, um, you have to excuse me, I get a bit, I lose words sometimes. Yeah. Um, so did my epilepsy in a whole new way. Yeah. So my, I've had epilepsy since I was 27, I'm 55 now. But it's always been controlled with meds. What meds were you on? Mm, just everything. Oh, right. Everything. Okay. I would be, you know, from one to another to another to another. To just or, try and sort it all yeah, out. Yeah, you know. Yeah. like I'd That's what also, life with epilepsy is, right, is meds. Yeah. I'd also been in the n- neurology system since then. So oh. quarter of a century in the neurology system. and That's all they've got. Yeah. Apart from, like, you know, cutting your head open and, I don't know, pulling something out of your brain, which they very, very rarely do. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all they've got. They've only got drugs. And there's some nutrition stuff these days, I think, So, which I haven't had to look into too much. Yeah, I have looked into it a little, but it's it seems to be quite extreme. And it's it's basically kind of keto. Yeah. Quite extreme keto. I've tried it. Well, I've tr- I've tried some version of it didn't have any didn't work in any way shape or form right. okay. i know that it tends to be better for children yes i don't know what the situation is for adults right okay but i have seen people charging massive amounts of money um right right yeah. okay so, yeah. that, so you started having these because you know as an epileptic who has been completely controlled since i was 19 yeah. To me, this is quite terrifying that this came back for you at this rate. And you yeah. hadn't had a seizure for years, had you? Well, I had oh. a handful a year, two or three, not many, not many. But yeah, at the same time, it was no longer controlled with the drugs. Yeah, I feel I feel that there's a real link between the beginning of my dad's passing and his actual passing, what's happened with my epilepsy, menopause perhaps, I don't know. I can't exactly ex- explain all of that to you. But, but no, um, there is definitely links. Um, I, I have other epileptic friends who have mm. said the same thing with them when menopause hit. They definitely went a bit haywire as well. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. And yeah, has that resolved yeah. or is that still ongoing? No, it's still it's still ongoing. So at the moment, I about every three weeks, I will have about a week's a week's worth of seizures. And these are big grandma seizures? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. I'm down for a whole week. So yeah. I just try and stay as horizontal as possible for that week because I've also had a lot of brain injuries, you know? Oh. Because right. when you fall, then oh, of course. you smash your head on whatever is around. Right. So, yeah. Right. It's a drag because it's really hard to plan my life. Of course, and I can't really have can't really have a teaching job like I used to. Right, you know, I used to teach creative writing, but um, yeah, you can't be having seizures. No, and you can't be taking a week off every three weeks either. No, so I mean, like, oh, because you know, a lot of menopause comes with sometimes with depression and things like this. But this must be just quite the the whammy with all of this. To get it is. A- but I'm not sure if it's exactly because of menopause. Like, I don't want to lay it at menopause's door. Right. right All okay. these things have converged, but what has caused what, I'm not sure. Yeah. And, and has it manifested in other ways with you, menopause at all? Yeah. I've also had the hot flushes, the um, a short period of kind of waking up in the middle of the night with, like, crazy sweats. Right. Um. But then as far as the brain fog goes, like I don't know what to blame that on either. Yeah, yeah. Because of the epilepsy, because of all the head injuries, um, you know, the the I have all kinds of crazy issues with word recall, mm. which I'm struggling with just a little bit today, but not too bad. But right. sometimes it can get incredibly intense where 
I just can't remember words. Has that um, affected when you were trying to write? No, it's okay with writing. I think there's some kind of different, there's a different thing that happens from the brain through the fingers, I'm sure. And anyway, if I can't remember a word, it's just it sets, it sets and come back to it later. Come back to it later, you know? yeah. And it's difficult, right, because that's your thing. You're performing, you're you're speaking. So that yeah. I imagine that would cut not getting those words. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. So... Um, and I mean, I remember because I had two seizures in one day when I was 19 and my brain was fucked for mm, quite some time. So I know how yeah. that is and how yeah. how frustrating it is, you know, and and, cause, and I remember at WOMAD you just had a seizure in the morning that you were performing and you mm. could see that you were feeling that. And it's just, yeah, I just want to. I want to make it go away for you because I know it must be just so, you know, it feels debilitating. But so are you finding hope through it? Yeah. I'm finding more just acceptance, actually. Which often is the same thing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, just being able to accept the way things are. And I spend a lot of time being really angry. Well, you know, being in bed for a whole year, right? Yes. Like, that's a lot of time to be angry. Was that about the epilepsy? I had other physical things going on as well where I pretty much couldn't get out of bed for right. quite some time. So I had a lot of time to be angry and resentful and sorry for myself yeah so yeah I guess it was quite good to experience all of that like that I mean it would have been um, better not to I'm sure but it would have been better not to but I don't want to carry all of this around with me all the time I still get bursts of it yeah you know, yeah feeling feeling those feelings but um I'm way better at accepting the way things are now you know. Great. And you've yeah. had a lot of success in the last couple of years. Yeah, I have. Your awards and book awards and yeah. smash hit plays. Like, yeah. does, has that helped? It has. Great. Definitely has. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's been a good year or two. Yeah. Um, and it's nice because it's kind of coincided with my 20 years of deciding to be a writer. And um, it's felt good. And especially after especially in the middle of an after a rough time. Well, I mean, congratulations on all of that as well because a lot of people do this for a long time yeah. without – I mean, no one would say that you were an overnight success because I think you that you've been around and you've been visible for a long time, but to get all those accolades at once for all of that work must just feel extremely satisfying. Yeah, it does. I am grateful for that as well. I really yeah. am. Grateful, but also you did that. So I did. People have recognized yeah. it, but you know, it's like I hate that word, I'm humbled. That always does my head in. It's like, don't be humbled. You you've done something that was fucking great and people have acknowledged yeah. that. So yeah. well done, you. Yeah. So now your daughter, she would have been going through puberty, sort of the same sort of time that you mm -hmm. were doing all of this. And is still going. She's 14 now and it's intense. Right. So that much um, hormone soup in one house is quite a lot. Yeah. Well, one interesting thing, when she got her first period. I hadn't bled for mm, a year, a year and a half. Right. And I came in and had a period Crazy. with her wow. for her for her first period. So it was kind of like a bonding you know, experience. Welcome to womanhood. <laughs> and and that was it. it. Was just the one. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's you know, if you were spiritual, uh, you could say that that is quite the connection there. That is yeah, sort of like a real yeah. moment. Look at that. I mean, for me. I do see the spiritual aspect of menopause. It's very much there for me. Yeah. Not every single day, but looking at the wider things, the wider kind of patterns and relationships, yeah. it's a thing. It's a and thing. have you talked to your daughter about it at all, menopause? Not about menopause, you know. Mm. She's got enough going on just with puberty, Yeah, which is – Freaking massive. Like I really had no idea it was going to be this kind of roller coaster. Right. I think I think I must have been a very again, I don't think there was any room for me to be having big dramas when I was her age. You okay. Know, there was too much going on in our family for for me to to be having dramas. But yeah, it's it's big and it's hard. For both of us, yeah, I'm having to grow some very saint-like qualities. 
at the moment. <laughs> having a teenage daughter. I'm just having to because all my other ways are not working. Yeah, so it's a process of elimination, is it? Yeah. See, parenting. I'm not doing a parenting yeah. podcast. I don't have a clue. Oh, fuck. <laughs> You know, congratulations to you is all I can say. <laughs> I've worked a long yeah. time towards not yeah, having yeah. children. So yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Well, I mean, everyone says they get better. They come out. I remember I was a bit of a nightmare to my dad for numerous years through all that time. They do get over it, hopefully. Fingers hopefully, crossed. Hopefully, hopefully, mm. yeah. I, I was a nightmare to myself. Yeah. But not to anyone else really. Right. Okay. So is there anything else that you wanted to talk to around menopause? Like, is it still going? Has it finished? All it's that sort still of stuff? going. Um, right. I wonder if maybe thus far I've had a fairly mild case of right. menopause. Mm-hmm. Like you haven't sought out treatment or anything like that? No, I haven't. Yeah. yeah. Although, you know, I've also had some depression and anxiety there's a lot with. going on there's You've a lot, lot going, going on, on. Yeah. but there's a lot going on in, in my life mm. you know mm. so I can't you know everything is everything with me well it's um, good that that hopefully this isn't adding to a sense of overwhelming you menopause no yeah no it's not and I think you know I have my hot flushes and I don't mind them that much right you know and Jim said she prefers a hot climate so she quite enjoyed them (laughs) yeah I don't mind them that much okay so I really feel the kind of shame that a lot of women might I think that's fantastic because there's so much of that and I think it's interesting too around that some people feel the shame that it's associated with this extreme age which of course is ridiculous because the average age is 51 so it's not Mm. so that's I mean that's massive I think being able to do that so congratulations for that as well I'm not saying I'm utterly shameless I mean I just talked about the whole marketplace business that's not fantastic (laughs) who can I fuck (laughs) yeah but um and you know a number of my friends who are the same age are deciding to go grey. Right. I'm like, hell no. Yeah, you know, um, me too. I'm no way. dying until I'm 80. <laughs> and I think, you know, and I, my mother's 87 and she's not completely grey yet. Right. My mum's 75 and she's got loads of hair. But I don't even know what my natural colour is. It's been since I was 18 is when I started dying. Yeah, well, hair. I mean, you know, my hair, Jesus says 60% grey at the front, 40 at the back. But, you know, I'm fighting it all the right. way to, to 80. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, and that's it. It's about what you want and how you want to do it. Yeah. Right, okay. So, yeah, you're on your way. you potentially three quarters of the way through. Who knows, I guess? Who knows? Who knows? I'm 55. My dad's, that's how I kind of trace it. My dad's been dead five years. So, yeah, I guess it's been about five years. But it's also, it also kind of comes in waves. It's not menopause, menopause every day, you right. know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. <laughs> I'm pleased. I wanted to do this to learn more about it, to know what to expect. And, of course, the only thing I've learned is that you don't know what to expect because everyone is so vastly different. So vastly different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I've got a lot of complicating factors. And I mean, obviously the epilepsy thing for me is. The epilepsy thing, yeah. The So you're scared of that? You're scared yeah. that it might trigger it? I mean, I haven't yeah. had a seizure since 1993. Right. So, and I haven't had, unlike you, you know, having those ones occasionally, I haven't. So, so you know, maybe it won't happen for me. I'm just, I've been so lucky as an epileptic in that I've been yeah. completely controlled. I realise yeah. that I'm so fortunate with that. Well, I mean, don't take this as menopause has triggered my epilepsy because that may not be the case. Mm. It might yeah. be my dad, my dad dying. It might be something else. It yeah. might just be something else on my brain. Who knows? But having said that, I also think it's good to know that that's something that could happen. Because I like to be forewarned mm-hmm. for things, yeah. And lots of things can happen, yeah. you know. Absolutely. I've got to say, I think I'm happier. I think I'm more content. Great. I think I'm more content now in a more content kind of state Great. than I probably ever have been. I mean, that's that's everything, isn't it? I mean, contentedness is such... There's so many things that you want, success and all that sort of stuff, but contentedness is just contentedness, this yeah. stillness. Not necessarily, but to me, I feel like that 
now too. I still, I'm so competitive and I'm a perfectionist and why have they got that and I haven't? And I feel yeah. that I'm, I'm, I'm letting all, it's definitely not gone yet, but I'm letting it go more. I think age has done that. I don't know if it'll ever go away because I mm. have all those things too. I don't know if it'll ever go away altogether because it's it's also part of our personalities, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think that, yeah, we have different, perhaps different parts of our lives, we have different kind of experiences mm. of Yeah, it, absolutely. You know? Right, okay. Yeah. Well, so now we're going to do that, my out-of-the-box piece. Do you have a menopause fun fact that you mm-hmm. can share with everybody, please? You know, I was looking for something really amazing like, um, menopause in Wales, yeah. but I couldn't find anything. However, um, today is what the thirteenth, I believe so. Of yep, October. So hold on to your hats because in five days it is World Menopause Day. Oh my God, I should know that. I did <laughs> on the eighteenth of October. On the eighteenth of October is World Menopause Day. Well, that is, is a fun fact. I mean, it every is. day is World Something Day, isn't it? So yeah. it's about time. Yeah. World Menopause Day. Uh, maybe I should write a poem for World Menopause yeah. Day. Well, thank. Yeah, that's like a really good fact to know. And you know, I can't believe that it's in the month that I've started doing this podcast. So and October is World Menopause Month. Oh, you are a bunch of fun facts. Look at I that. I know. I did a lot of Googling <laughs> last night to try and find something that would be as interesting as Pinky's Wales. Pinky's Wales. I know. I think she's lucky that she was first. I don't know. It was going to be interesting to see how people come with their facts <laughs> after this. Right. Okay. Well, and, and I believe, which is fitting for the fabulous poet that you are, that you might have a poem for us now. I do have a poem. Yes. And it is not specifically about menopause, but it Mm -hmm. is about my relationship with my body, my aging body. Okay. It's called, You've Got Your Grandmother's Bum. (laughs) Last time she was here in New Zealand, I was eight or nine or some other really impressionable age. So a group of words out of the mouth of an adult could float on the air like a teeny errant wasp, in through my ear canal, burrowing its way to my brain to hatch its babies, which grew and grew to make sounds, which reverberate back and forth between my ears, like a game of wasp volleyball. You've got your grandmother's bum. Yes, you've got your grandmother's bum. My sister used to laugh at my grandmother behind her back because her bum was big. It was wide and it swayed, not in a way we thought beautiful, but like a sinking ship, like a ship in peril, like a ship thrown up by the massive scary waves and plunging down so fast that the screaming people on board lost their footing flew up into the sky and drowned in the savage sea. You've got your grandmother's bum. Now I know she came here in 1970-something to replace the hip that could no longer hold her even. She pitched when she walked. She limped when she walked. She lurched and cast and heaved when she walked, and because she was old school Samoan, and even though she was in New Zealand, and even though it was pretty cold down there, she still sat cross-legged on our floor. It took the careful construction of three pyramids to get up. First, the turning of her waist, hands flat on the floor to one side, then the brace of her elbows the first triangle, then the lower body twist and the hoist to her knees made the second, then feet flat, legs braced, her head to the floor, her hips, her bum, the flat top of the final pyramid. I used to watch her in awe, construct Giza many times a day. Now I do yoga, I know the downward dog was the only way she could get up off the floor. It's the only way I can get up now. Now I have my grandmother's arthritic hip. Now I have 
my grandmother's bum. Thank you very much for that. I just, you know, poetry, we know what it's like. People can judge poetry, particularly people that don't understand the power it can have. I and mean, what I like to describe about poetry is it can sometimes, like a wasp, I imagine, or like little darts that just shoot under the skin and just give you this moment of going, oh, just talking about that wasp at the beginning gave me that feeling. And I just, just the ev- ev- evocation of the words from it. So thank you for that. That was You're fabulous. Welcome. And thank you very much for spending some time with me today. I... I want you to know how magnificent you are in all ways and I, I'm glad that you are content and that you're seeing hope through it all because I know that you've got a lot going on and you're fucking awesome. So thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure, Penny. I'm glad. It's really nice to sit down with you in front of millions of people <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, have this this heart to heart. It's really it's quite it's quite it's quite full on, isn't it? It's quite yeah, frank and stuff yeah, too. Yeah. So yeah, well, thank you very much for that, yeah. and we'll see you when we see you. Okay, in Christchurch. What I'm allowed out of Fortress Auckland now. Okay, okay, my love. Bye. Bye. So that was the fantabulous Tusiata Avia, who has been a fantastic judge at the poetry slams that I have run and is a force to be reckoned with on stage. If you get a chance, see her do that. And I'm really happy that despite she's got a lot going on, that she's found the contenderness that she has. So also buy her book, go and see, go and see, go and see it in all good bookstores. The Savage Colonizer, buy that one. It's won all these awards, so it is a great book of poetry. Also, if you get a chance, she's not performing it as much now, but there is a group of younger women performing Wild Dogs Under My Skirt. They're the ones who've been smashing it in New York and around, I'm sure it'll be going to lots of festivals around New Zealand. So see that one when you can. Okay, so thank you so very much again for listening to my podcast. I've had some great numbers so far and some really lovely feedback, which is great because I am a very needy person. Just ask my husband. Uh, This has been quite a big departure for me. So getting that feedback has been incredible. If you've enjoyed yourself, then please head along to the Apple podcast where you might just give me five stars and a nice review. If you haven't really enjoyed it, just keep it to yourself. No one likes a whiner. That would be great. Also, you could share it. That would be fabulous on all of your social media platforms. You can find me on mine. So my Facebook is Hot Pink Penny Ashton. My Twitter is at Penny Pink. Instagram is Pinash. And YouTube is Penny Ash. There's also my website, which is hotpink.co.nz. And you could email me if you want. If you've got any questions or suggestions, my email's on my website. And if you'd like to support this podcast because I have no work forever, then you can join my merry band of seven patrons. It's very exciting. And I would like to welcome Nicola Welton, Jacqueline Vaughan, and Jennifer O'Sullivan, Ray, who are my newest patrons. I love you very dearly. If you sign up to my Patreon, there's various tiers. You can find things like wondrous cartoons that I've drawn, exciting, and lots of other things. Also, all the episodes will be going up there early. I think that's enough for me, rabbiting on. Thanks again for listening to Show We Ovaries. I I probably don't need to do a theme song because there's one playing right now underneath me by the time I edit it into play. So, Kakite, I'll see you next time when I flash those Show We Ovaries.